Hi gang! I have a fascination with all things history, mystery, conspiracy, and paranormal. So welcome to Sit and Spin. My name is Tamsin and I shall be your guide through a crazy and mysterious story as I spin today flax into linen. I'm continuing to work on the two pounds. There is an instructional video that I will post earlier. So for today, grab your coffee, your spinning wheel if you want, or you can sit and watch or sit and listen, however you would like to take in the story. So let's spin a yarn. I need coffee. You knew I couldn't go through a whole introduction without saying that. Let's go. Just south of Adelaide, South Australia, in Australia, big surprise there, an unidentified man was found dead on a beach on December 1st, 1948. Sad, sure, but why are we still talking about it 73 years later? Well, my dears, this is a deep, deep rabbit hole. Follow me and we'll dive on in. At 6.30 a.m. on December 1st, 1948, police were contacted about the body of a man found lying propped against the seawall at the Somerton Park Beach near Glenelg, southwest of Adelaide. Glenelg? Glenelg. I don't know. It's a weird word. His legs were extended, his feet were crossed, and an unlit cigarette was on the right collar of his shirt like he died before he had a chance to light it. It was assumed he had just settled there and died. But they needed to identify him, so they searched his pockets. Here's what they found. An unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach. A bus ticket from the city that may not have been used a U.S. manufactured narrow aluminum comb, a half empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an army club cigarette pack, which actually contains several Kensita's cigarettes, a completely different brand, and a quarter full box of Bryant and May matches. But there was nothing to identify the man. Witnesses said on the evening of November 30th, they had seen the man lying in the same spot and position. One couple said they saw him extend his right arm around 7 p.m. Another couple noticed him in passing from between 7.30 to about 8 p.m. while they were on the beach. And while they never actually saw him move, they believed he had changed position. An individual witness claimed that she had seen another man looking down at what she thought was a sleeping man from the top of the steps leading to the beach. But no one knew who he was. Even his clothes told them nothing. He wore a white shirt, a red, white, and blue tie, brown pants, socks and shoes, a knitted brown pullover, and a double-breasted jacket of gray and brown with apparently American tailoring. But all the labels had been removed and unusual for the time, no hat was found. This was the age of the fedora, and no sharp-dressed man would be without his fedora. Police circulated his description. Quote, five foot 11 inches tall, with gray eyes, fair to ginger-colored hair, slightly graying around the temples, broad shoulders and a narrow waist, hands and nails that showed no signs of manual labor, big and little toes that met in a wedge shape like those of a dancer or someone who wore boots with pointed toes, and pronounced high calf muscles consistent with people who regularly wore boots or shoes with high heels or performed ballet." End quote. I would swipe right on Tinder for this guy. There was no obvious cause of death, and as the man appeared so peaceful on the beach, they were ready to call it suicide. 
Autopsy showed some concerning things in the body, but nothing that could definitively be called cause of death. The coroner concluded it was likely a poison, but no traces were found in the body. There was nothing to indicate the man's identity, and even dental records didn't match any known person. An inquest into the man's death was started a few days after the discovery of the body, but it was adjourned until June 17, 1949, in hopes of finding more information. With no positive identification and no indication that an actual crime had taken place, the body was embalmed and a bust was made of the man's face for hopefully future identification. There was a brief moment of hope when the Adelaide Railway Station staff found a brown suitcase with its label removed on January 14, 1949. The suitcase had been checked into the station cloakroom at 11 a.m. on November 30, 1948. As the labels were removed from the clothing, it seemed likely to belong to the mystery body. Along with the clothes, there were some interesting and unexpected things. They were an electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut into a short, sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc to be used as a protective sheath for the makeshift weapons, a stenciling brush used on merchant ships for marking cargo, a thread card of Barbour brand wax thread that wasn't available in Australia, but it had been used to repair the lining on the trousers the dead man was wearing. So definitely his suitcase. Though all the labels had been removed from the clothes, there were three name tags, a common practice during wartime since clothing was hard to come by. T. Keane, K-E-A-N-E, was on a tie, Keen spelt the same way on a laundry bag, and Keen spelt K-E-A-N on a singlet, the all-in-one underwear tank top common at the time. Police didn't know if these name tags had been overlooked when the labels were removed, or if they'd purposely been left on, knowing the dead man's name wasn't Keen. A search concluded that no T. Keen was missing in any English-speaking country, and a search of the dry cleaning marks also turned up nothing. The only other information gained was that a coat found in the suitcase had been manufactured in the United States and was not one that was imported to Australia. Checking train records, it was determined the man had arrived in Adelaide by overnight train from Melbourne, Sydney, or Port Augusta. He had checked his suitcase, purchased a ticket for the 10.50 a.m. train to Henley Beach, which he missed, left the station and caught a bus to Glenig, where he died on a beach. So the police really had no further information when the coroner's inquest came up again. They re-examined the body and clothes and found a tiny piece of rolled up paper in a fob pocket that had been sewn into the dead man's trouser pockets. This had been missed the first time they searched the clothes. Printed on the paper were two words, Temam Shud. Eh, what? <laughs> That's kind of what they thought. They're like, what, what is that? Well, Librarians are the heroes of this story. They came through identifying the phrase as meaning ended or finished and that it was found on the last page of the, okay, bear with me here, Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, I think. If I've brutalized pronunciations, I apologize. I'm just a valley girl who's not good with languages. The hunt was on to find the copy of the book that little slip of paper had been torn from. A man named Ronald Francis came forward with the book. He had found it in his unlocked car, parked on Jetty Road, Glenig, just after the man was found dead on the beach at Somerton. 
It was determined Francis had no other connection to the case, but the find further puzzled and confused. Why tear out the small scrap of printing and toss the book in a car? Certain there must be more to the book, police began poring over it. The book is about how one should live life to the fullest and have no regrets when it ends. The poem's subject backed up police theories that the man had committed suicide by poison, although no other evidence corroborated this theory. The book was indeed missing the words Tamal Mashoud on the last page. And a microscopic test confirmed the slip was indeed from the book. In the back of the book, were faint indentations of five lines of text in capital letters. The second line was crossed out, but it was very similar to the fourth line and probably represented an error in a, encryption. Initially, the letters were thought to be words in a foreign language, but they were determined that to be actually a code. Experts were unable to decipher the lines. In 1978, after analyzing the text, cryptographers reported that it would be impossible to decode successfully since the brevity meant there were insufficient symbols to extract a clear meaning. And with so little to work with, the text could just be the meaningless product of a disturbed mind. I think they were just covering up the fact that they couldn't figure out his brilliant code. Also in the back of the book, there was a phone number. Like, that shouldn't have been the primary clue. The number belonged to a nurse who lived on Mosley Street, Glenlig, about 1,300 feet north of where the body was found. Originally, she was only identified by the name Justin to protect the identity of the woman, but her name was actually Jessica Ellen Thompson. Thompson said that she did not know the dead man or why he would have her phone number or why he would choose to visit her suburb on the night of his death. However, she also reported that at some time in late 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and had asked a next door neighbor about her. When she was shown the bust of the dead man, Thompson said she could not identify that person, but her reaction upon seeing the bust was described as, quote, completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance that she was about to faint, end quote. Since it was just a bust she was viewing and not a body, that seems a bit of an extreme reaction. Thompson revealed that while she was working at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of the Rubia, but she had given it to an Australian Army lieutenant named Alf Boxall. After the war ended, she had moved to Melbourne and married. When she had received a letter from Boxall, she had told him that she was now married and there was no evidence that he had contacted her after 1945. So, police now suspect that Boxall is the dead man. However, in July 1949, Boxall was found alive in Sydney and was unaware of any link between the dead man and himself. Another dead end. And Thompson wasn't being any help at all, though everyone was pretty sure she knew more than she was telling. There was persistent speculation that the dead man was a spy. At least two sites close to Adelaide were of interest to spies, the Radium Hill Uranium Mine and the Woomera Test Range, an Anglo-Australian military research facility. The man's death also coincided with a reorganization of Australian security agencies, which would culminate the following year with the founding of the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, which led to a crackdown on Soviet espionage in Australia. So, of course, this is the start, I believe, of the Cold War. And any spies would assume to be Russian, since the Germans had been completely crushed in World War II. Another theory concerns Boxall, who was reportedly involved in intelligence work 
during and immediately after World War II. In a 1978 television interview with Boxall, reporter Stuart Littermore suggested there may have been an espionage connection to the dead man in Adelaide. Boxall replied, quote, it's quite a melodramatic thesis, isn't it? End quote. Well, that's not really an answer at all, but with no connection between Boxall and the Somerton man, nothing has ever been proven. In 1949, the body of the unknown man was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery by the Salvation Army to save the man from a pauper's burial. Years after, flowers began mysteriously being left on the grave. No one ever saw who was doing it. Could it be a long lost relative of the Somerton man who for whatever reason didn't come forward and identify him? Over the years, there were many theories and conspiracies about who the Somerton man might be. The complete lack of identity just seemed to catch the public's interest and they just kept bringing it up over and over again. So in 1994, Chief Justice of Victoria and Chairman of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, John Harbour Phillips, reviewed the case to determine the cause of death and concluded that there seemed little doubt it was digitalis. He pointed out that the organs were engorged consistent with digitalis, that there was a lack of evidence of natural disease and an absence of anything seen macroscopically or outside the body, which could account for the death. And again, more theories and conspiracies and wild speculation. So in March, 2009, University of Adelaide, profess Adelaide? Adelaide professor, Derek Abbott led a team in an attempt to solve the case. It was discovered that the Somerton man's autopsy reports of 1948 and 1949 were now missing and other key evidence no longer exists, such as the brown suitcase, which was destroyed in 1986. In addition, witness statements have disappeared from the police file over the years. The plaster bust made of the Somerton man, however, was held by the South Australian Police Historical Society. And the bust contains strands of the man's hair. In December 2017, hairs were submitted for analysis to the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA at the University of Adelaide. In February 2018, the team obtained a high-definition analysis of the mitochondrial DNA from the hair sample of the Somerton man. They found that he and his mother belonged to the, okay, bear with me here, haplogroup, H4A1A1A, something that's possessed by only 1% of Europeans. Oh, this name, I don't know. Massage? M-A-C-I-E-J, however you would like to pronounce that. I'll stick to his last name, Hennenberg. He's the professor of anatomy at the University of Adelaide, and he examined images of the Somerton man's ears. He found that the Somerton man's Simba, the upper ear hollow, is larger than his cavum, the lower ear hollow. And this feature is possessed by only one to two percent of the Caucasian population. In May 2009, dental experts concluded that the Somerton man had hypodontia, which is a rare genetic disorder of both lateral incisors. And this feature is only present in about two percent of the general population. So all these things significantly lower the percentage of the population the Somerton man could belong to, but without specific people to compare him to, these are just generalities. But then, in June 2010, Professor Derek Abbott obtained a photograph of Jessica Thompson, the nurse, her eldest son, Robin. That's all right. 
be Jessica Thompson, the nurse who claims she didn't know the Summerton man. This photo of her son, Robin, clearly showed that he, like the Summerton man, had not only a larger Simba than Cavum, but also hypodontia. The chance that this was a coincidence has been estimated as between 1 in 10 million and 1 in 20 million. So the media suggested that Robin Thompson, who was 16 months old in 1948, may have been the child of the Summerton man and passed off as Prosper Thompson, Jessica's husband's son. DNA testing could confirm or eliminate this speculation. But even without a Thompson family DNA sample, Abbott believed an ex exhumation and DNA test could provide a short list of surnames, which along with the existing clues to the man's identity, could be the final piece of the puzzle. In November 2013, Kate Thompson, the daughter of Jessica and Prosper Thompson, said in a TV interview that her mother confessed she had lied to the police. And not only did Jessica know the identity of the Somerton man, but his identity was also known at a level higher than the police force. Kate suggested that her mother and the Somerton man may both have been spies. Jessica had taught English to migrants, was interested in communism, and could speak Russian, although she never said where she learned it or why. Kate's brother Robin had passed away, but his widow Roma and his daughter Rachel suggested that the Somerton man was indeed Robin's father and therefore Rachel's grandfather. They filed a new application with the Attorney General to have the Somerton man's body exhumed and DNA tested. Kate Thompson opposed the request as being disrespectful to her brother Robin. In 2011, the Attorney General had refused to exhume the body, stating, quote, There needs to be public interest reasons that go well beyond public curiosity or broad scientific interest. End quote. He said this despite still being contacted by people in Europe who believed the man was a missing relative. That strikes me as more than being public curiosity. In October 2019, however, Attorney General Vicki Chapman granted approval for exhumation to extract DNA for analysis. It was paid for by the interested parties, and they had potential granddaughter's DNA to compare to the own unknown man's to see if it was a match. The potential granddaughter is, of course, Rachel Egan, Robin's daughter, granddaughter of Jessica Thompson. But get this, she's married to University of Adelaide professor Derek Abbott. They met after he sent her a letter to explain why he thought she might be the Somerton man's granddaughter. After a single dinner dominated by talk of death and DNA, the pair decided to marry. They now have three children, a girl aged eight and twins aged six and they are all eagerly awaiting to find out the Somerton man's true identity. Now, thanks to the stupid pandemic and the world being shut down for a while, the exhumation wasn't done until May 19th, 2021. And this is what led me to do this piece on the Somerton man. I had heard of him before, I knew the story, but when I saw that they were actually exhuming them to test DNA, I got so excited. We still don't know if they were even able to extract DNA from the corpse. We're going to have to wait along with this family, I'm sure, who's very eager to discover if this is actually Rachel's grandfather. This is closer to a possible answer than anyone has been in over 70 years. Hopefully, we'll hear fairly soon what the outcome is, whether positive or negative. 
And maybe, just maybe, we'll have some more answers on the Somerton Man. I hope you enjoyed a good yarn. And I will see you next time on Sit and Spin. Thanks for joining me. Bye.